Hey everyone, this is Emily Motter with Hospitality Minnesota. We've got Rachel O'Leary and Karen Blazik from CLA. Um, we're going to give ourselves two minutes um, in case anyone else still needs to sign on and then we will get started. I need hold music. <laughs> Sing a little something for us. <laughs> I've done that on some webinars where I've had like my Spotify playing in the background and today I did not think to do it. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Karen's actually a vocalist. Oh. I'm actually a, a musician. I mean, musicians can be vocalists, obviously. Um, I'm a violinist. <laughs> oh, that's right. You did I tell me that. Gave you extra credit there, Karen. Don't, don't make me say the voice in there, too. <laughs> taking these other issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give it one more minute uh, and then we'll get going. Okay, um, so once again, um, welcome everyone. Um, I am Emily Motter, the event strategist here at Hospitality Minnesota. Today we have Karen Blasick and Rachel O'Leary from CLA, and they are going to be talking with us. Um, we're excited to have them in the first of our Operating Now webinar series, which is going to be covering a lot of topics over the next six weeks that address um, the new, I don't even want to call it the new normal because I don't know what normal is anymore, but the new conditions that we're all operating under. Um, Rachel and Karen today are going to be talking about um, some restaurant operations tips as you're starting to reopen, um, PPP loan forgiveness, and then some tax considerations. Um, as a reminder, we've got a few more webinars scheduled um, this Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, Explore Minnesota is going to give us some information about their recent consumer attitude survey and give us some background on their See You Soon campaign. Um, you may have seen some of the commercials airing over Fourth of July weekend. Um, next Tuesday, a week from today, we've got Hospitality and COVID-19 Mitigating mm -hmm. Health and Legal Risks with Nyla Johnson-Lewis. Um, I know a lot of folks have asked about liability and waivers and all those kinds of things. So that will be a great session to attend to get some information there. Tuesday the 21st, we've got Making Your Web Presence Work For You with Minnesota Web Marketing. Um, and that will be a good place to learn about how to make sure your website um, reinforces that you are up to date with kind of all the COVID uh, um, precautions we need to be taking, making sure you're clearly communicating that, how to make sure your presence just seems reliable on the internet, especially in uh, the context of COVID-19. And then coming up on July 28th, we'll have challenging customer conversations with Ridge Training, um, and that will be an opportunity to learn how to, you know, manage your customers and make sure everyone is on board with wearing masks and kind of how to navigate those conversations for the folks who may not feel comfortable doing that and all that kind of stuff. Um, so those are the webinars we've got coming up. We'll have a few more in August as well. Um, and then a few notes for today's webinar. Um, Rachel and Karen will, of course, share all their wonderful information with us. If you have questions, please submit those in the chat. There should be a button um, at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen that has a little voice bubble. So just answer your questions there. Um, and we'll be taking questions kind of throughout the course of the webinar. Um, and then if there's any at the end, we can get into those as well. So I'm going to switch over to um, Karen and Rachel's PowerPoint, and then we will get started. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. Yes. So um, you can go to the next slide. So um, I'm basically the restaurant leader for CLA nationwide. I happen to be in Minnesota. 
I work out of our office in Minneapolis. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk really about two areas. Um, I have an extensive background in restaurants um, prior to coming to CLA, mostly in the finance and accounting area, but actually um, have partnered very closely with the head of operations uh, most recently at uh, when I was at the Bartman Group, and then before that at Famous Dave's of America. So basically I uh, have spent a lot of time with operations. I really feel that finance and accounting people should be partnering with operations. Um, and really can learn a lot from each other instead of working in our silos as often happens. So one of the things that I always like to think about are what are some of the operational uh, issues that are going on and obviously uh, no one has to remind anybody of what's happening with social distancing and things like that. So I just thought I'd throw in a few slides here on the operations side to just talk about some of the things I've been thinking about uh, that I think restaurants are, are executing on now as they're reopening in Minnesota especially, uh, but also just anywhere wherever you are in the country. So one of the first things I wanted to mention was in sanitation and social distancing. So one of the things um, that obviously uh, I'm sure you've seen if you've been at a restaurant other than your own uh, group that you're with, but really make cleaning a customer visible activity. So really make sure, I was just in a restaurant over the weekend, was my first time uh, out in uh, three or four months, and I was able to really see them being very, very on top of cleaning off tables and making sure everybody had masks and things like that. While it is a, is a law, it's a rule, um, it's still, you know, it's good to see that made very visible to the, to the guest. Um, also, obviously you want to invest in adequate supply of masks and sanitizer for both the front of house and back of house. Just because we're doing something that's visible to the customer, uh, we also obviously need to be making sure we're taking care of all the same things in the back of the house as well. Um, consider branding opportunities. So, you know, I was in a rest, this restaurant I was in, they actually had masks that had their logo on the mask that they had had made for the, for the personnel. So I think from that perspective, it, anything that you can do to, again, um, really uh, show your brand um, with these cleaning supplies and masks, just sets that in the customer's mind. It, it leaves them feeling, wow, that was a, it was a clean restaurant. I felt safe. Um, and it helps you them remember your restaurant. It, it sounds silly, but I think it really is effective. Um, and then social distancing markers. I think we've all probably been in fast food locations that are putting little stickers on the floor to help you understand the social distancing spaces and things like that. Um, another thing that I really encourage restaurants to do while they were shut down before they reopened is really thinking about the lighting and sort of the setup of a dining room where you have a lot of dine-in uh, guests typically. So while there's no dining guests, you know, really think about that decor, really think about simplifying things, make it easy to walk through the area so people don't feel like they're, they're having to walk into things or get around things or be close to people and all these things really matter. And the lighting, I think, being brighter maybe, I think gives that impression of things being cleaner, things being more accessible and safer. Um, then the last point on this slide was really making sure training for the staff, right? I mean, it's really going to be important for them to understand and be able to guide the guest on what is proper social distancing and for them to be able to sort of handle the traffic flow when you've got uh, people. We'll get to that in a minute on another slide. So next slide, please. So next we're going to talk about marketing and social media. So as we had mentioned earlier, you know, it's, this is really the time if you haven't had uh, an investment in a good website, and as I see you're going to be having a presentation coming up on that, really, really, really critical. It doesn't matter what type of concept you have, whether it's fast food, whether it's fine dining, really invest in a good website that, that you can maintain. A lot of websites can be beautiful, but they're so hard to update that to be able to provide information about what maybe you have different hours right now of operation. Maybe you want to talk about a reservation system that you just put in place and, and put a plug in for that to let your guests know that you should be making reservations because you're at less than 100% capacity, things like that. Tell your COVID story about how you make the customer feel safe and protected and just have a few blurbs on your website talking about what your practices are. Even though we kind of all know generally the rules. I think uh, to be telling that story and talking about how, how it's so important, I think it really makes the guests feel much more relaxed uh, in the experience, especially in those first few experiences, I think, getting back out there in a uh, dining environment. 
think about the revenue levers to lean into. You know, obviously the website can do a lot to support off-premise activity, whether that's online ordering, third-party delivery, catering, all those types of revenue levers are very critical. And as you all know in the restaurant industry, the situation is that, you know, just relying on dine-in is not going to cut it. And I think as we continue to hear about some issues with the virus maybe returning, uh, states having to close down for a period of time, all these things that are in the media right now in different states across the country, um, you know, can happen at any time. So I think it's really, as you go forward, leaning into more of off-premise and what can your concept do in off-premise, and then really use that website to, to build followers and, and to really get more people interested in off-premise, uh, as you probably have been doing during the shutdown period, and really continue to lean into that. Now, I would say uh, updating your food photography is also very important. You know, make sure that if you've made changes in your menu, uh, be able to really um, highlight those items. Maybe there's certain special things that you've created during the downtime. Um, use that website to advertise your reopening. Obviously, that's kind of a duh. And then get active with social media posts um, so that you can really highlight those items, maybe highlight some customer testimonials. I looked at the restaurant I went to, I had not been there before, and I saw that someone had posted something very recently. So I knew that that gave me some security that things were good because that person talked about how clean the restaurant was and in their post. Normally they wouldn't be talking about that so much, right? They'd be talking about maybe the food or the service, but I think it's a sign of the times, if you will. Um, so now to the next slide. So congestion. So obviously, uh, one of the issues that comes up with the social distancing, and depending on the size of your of your foyer and your restaurant, people walk in, is really try to come up with a place to segregate the off-premise pickups that are going on, people that are not doing curbside, but they're actually coming in, third-party delivery services that come in to pick up the order for the customer, really try to get that into one place in the restaurant so people can have a sign, they can know where to go, and they're not kind of mingling or getting involved with those maybe uh, getting seated in the dine-in part of the restaurant. So really try to segregate those areas. Um, as I mentioned, take reservations for a lot of concepts that really didn't want to bother doing that. Um, now is really a good way to be able to then pace out your capacity by taking uh, those reservations and being able to manage that with your staffing levels, as well as what you're able to do uh, in terms of how many people you can seat and things like that and manage your tables. Um, I think this whole, I had, I had read somewhere, you know, someone was saying, hey, we can text our customers when their table is ready. We don't really let the entire party of four or six wait in the lobby of the restaurant. They wait outside and we text them when their table's ready. So then they just walk in and sit down. So there's no standing around. There's no taking up a lot of space. It just causes people to get very anxious right now. They don't want to be around people very close, even if it's only for a few minutes. So I think anything like that that you can do to really just make it easy to walk in and sit down and not have people mingling about, I think is very, very important. I read an article yesterday that was talking about the whole industry is all about mingling, right? We love serving customers. We love having people in the restaurant and makes it very vibrant. And this is a hot industry all about hospitality, which is really hard right now. And so it's like the opposite of why you want to open a restaurant. You know, you want people to be around. So it is very hard to think of these terms, but I think this is what's needed to really make the guests feel very safe and secure during these times. Um, monitor the social distancing I mentioned here, maybe the GM, maybe it wouldn't be the GM, maybe it'd be an additional staff front a house person that you kind of designate to really just kind of keep an eye on how people are separating from each other so that there's no issues of maybe someone having a problem and reporting it somewhere, causing some bad PR for your company or some potential closure or something like that. So I think just kind of monitoring the behavior of the guests in the dining room is very important right Right now to just make sure if you have staff members that aren't being as careful as others, you can kind of nip that in the bud, you know, with, with your front of house staff. Um, I think also just the social distancing markers, I think it's really important. People don't know what six feet apart looks like. I've lost my slides. <laughs> Hang on one second, Karen. I'm going to pull it up on a different screen because part of it was cut off. Hold on.
Bear with me here, folks. And unfortunately, I don't have a printout to look at. Hold on, hold on one second. Okay. Point though, Karen, we all talk about six feet apart, but I don't know that most people can visualize that six feet without, I mean, the markers on the floor, I've been to a few restaurants myself, and it is nice to be able to see that actually laid out. So right. that you're not trying to guess or, you know, even if I'm not uncomfortable, I don't want to make you uncomfortable by being too close and those kind of things. It's nice to kind of know where you're supposed to be. Yeah, and I think the other piece of that is also not just the apart from each other, like say in a line that you're waiting or whatever, but also where those markers are in relation to the staff. So like if you go into a, like a subway or some sort of a fast food restaurant where there's a counter and there's people walk, working behind that counter, I've seen that they've also designated, hey, I don't want you right up against that counter breathing down the necks of the people at Chipotle or Subway or whatever preparing the food. So I think there's also a lot of considerations for the staff as well to keep them safe. And I think everyone talks a lot about the guests and that's important, but I think it's also very important to think about what distance do you need between your staff and the customer to keep your staff healthy and safe, right? So the last yeah. point here is really just to think about um, having someone in the front of the house, a team member that can be trained to really mon monitor the to-go and the dine in traffic, I call it. So basically someone who can answer questions that, that the guests might have about the safety and the cleanliness. A lot of people are asking questions. I was at a hair salon with my husband yesterday and they were, and this woman called in, you could tell, and she was asking all these questions. Well, do you wear masks? Do you, how, you know, far apart do you stand? All these things. And you can imagine they probably get 30 calls a day like that. So it's like, how how do you, you know, kind of show that in the moment you're, you're aware of this and, and you're doing the right things and you're kind of dealing with things as they come up, as we know things happen uh, in a restaurant. So, so that was that slide. Let's go on to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit now about the guest experience. So one of the things that I think um, we've seen coming out of this, and I don't know that anyone could have necessarily predicted it, is that we're not seeing the return of traffic in restaurants to levels pre-COVID yet. And even if they're at 50% capacity, I wouldn't say that any restaurant I've looked in the door of lately, there's been 50% of the capacity in there. So while there's social distancing that we have to, to um, respect, um, I'm not seeing that there's many restaurants that are really full to the capacity they're allowed to serve at. Well, so why is that? Well, I think there are things about the guest experience that, that owners and operators should be thinking about in terms of make it exciting to dine in. We really need to think nowadays about differentiating the dining experience from the to-go experience. We've put a lot of effort into creating a good to-go experience, curbside pickup, different delivery uh, processes and mechanisms, but it's really like, why would someone wanna dine in, right? So it's like, what can you do to really enhance that experience, whether that's upgrading your linens, putting really nice, create, get really good card stock to do your menus. Maybe you're doing a daily menu with specials on it or something to really make it differentiated. But I think when a guest comes in and sees some of these service touches, um, and again, this is also seen in the front of the house staff, how have they been trained to really make that customer feel like a VIP? Because I think that customer is going to walk away from that experience and be a much more longer term guest for your concept uh, because they all not only felt safe but they felt special and I think a lot of times with a with a, a restaurant that maybe has finer cuisine doesn't travel as well doesn't look as great in a to-go package so that you need that dining guest that's going to appreciate the quality of your food the uniqueness of it and to me the experience is now at least equal to the food, um, the part of the food of the eating and the what, what you're serving. So I think from that perspective, it's really, really vital to, to really be thinking top of mind around the experience that that guest is having as part of the dine-in. 
Um, some of the other ideas I've been hearing about, you know, things like imp changing your menus, have some good value items on there for people that maybe are working off of a single income right now. Maybe they have people laid off in their family and they still want to go out and have that one or two experience, you know, a, a month or a week or whatever they can afford, but put some new items on so your, your loyal guests that are now coming back can see you've been innovating, you've been doing something different. Um, and then I think it's always about understanding what are the favorite items that your guests just really crave. And oh boy, you know, what is the first thing they want to do when they can go back to restaurants? They're going to think about your concept and that, you know, coconut shrimp or whatever it is that you make that people just really crave. So I think it's really highlighting some of those guest favorite items that you've seen for years have been have been top of mind for your for your customers. And then I think it's also about while well, you're continuing you know, to focus on the dining guests now, don't lose focus on the off-premise guest, right? You wanna to continue to enhance that experience for your off-premise guests because they're gonna to continue to utilize that. I think one of the things that not everybody really thought about is not only the importance of a drive-through window, you know, but what happens when that guest has been ordering to go and now they can sit down and eat are they going to make every occasion now a dining occasion? Is, it going to, is, the, is the to go going to go back down to the percentage it was before COVID? Probably not. I think you're, we're, what we're seeing nationally is that restaurant concepts are saying, hey, you know, I can, maybe I'm not going to keep my to go at the level it was at during the COVID days because that was all the revenue I had. But I bet I can keep a good portion of that because I may have related now to a different uh, customer base that maybe didn't think to come and dine in and, and they wanted to, to do that. Um, to go was convenient for them and they like that. Well, now it's like try to preserve that new base of customers you have while you're still going to have your dining guests coming back because they've craved your experience and your food and they want to come back. So I think it's really continuing to explore possible in-house delivery if you're a larger concept or all the different things related to off-premise that I'm sure you all know about. So let's go on. Okay. So PPP loan forgiveness. So what I'm gonna talk about in this section of the presentation is really related to not just forgiveness, but it's really related to the PPP process. And you may think, well, why does Karen wanna talk about PPP loans? Gosh, isn't that old news? Uh, that's been around since April. Well, yes, it has, which April seems like six months ago. I don't know about you guys, but I feel that way. Um, so what I wanna talk about though, is that I have had clients recently apply for PPP loans that didn't apply back in April or May because they weren't ready to reopen their restaurant and they didn't know when they were gonna be able to reopen their restaurant and even at 25 percent capacity they didn't know if they wanted to reopen their restaurant at, at that level of capacity so now they're saying wow there have been some changes to the program which i'm going to highlight here in a second and now that seems a lot more reasonable to get a ppp loan so i'm going to apply so i'm going to talk a little bit about recent updates on that so let's go on to the next slide here so we just say that you know legal advice all that disclaimer stuff so you've seen it okay can move on. All right, so what's happened in the last literally week? Last week, I was excited we were doing this webinar today because this just got signed into law. I wasn't called the PPP extension, I made that up. I don't even know what they called it, but basically right around the 4th of July holiday, uh, the president signed in, into law an extension to the period of time to apply for PPP loans. So if you haven't gotten a PPP loan, you still have a month to do that. So I encourage everybody uh, to do that because now with the Flexibility Act that got signed into law June 5th, now you're able to have 24 weeks to spend your PPP money. And so we're really looking at a situation, even in places like Los Angeles and, and other um, states in the country that have had problems with reopening, they're gonna, you'll still have plenty of time to spend that money on payroll costs to be able to be forgiven probably 100% because the amount of dollars that you're receiving is based on two and a half months of payroll. And if you don't open up till September or October, you're still gonna have time to spend that. So even from getting funding in July. So think about it from that perspective. And if you haven't considered a PPP loan, I would strongly recommend it. In, in, in some ways, it really is free money. Uh, if you can, if you can time it right and all of that. So what did the flex, what else did the Flexibility Act do? Well, it extended the covered period for spending that money to 24 weeks from the date of funding. So if you're funded July 10th, 
um, you, you know, you have 24 weeks from that. Um, if you have been a borrower and now you're moving into the end of your eight weeks, you can still have an eight week period. The one thing I didn't put on the slide, which is kind of a little bit of a interpretation, if you will, is that if it takes you 12 weeks to spend your two and a half months of payroll based on where you're located and when you reopen and how much level of staff you need, what percentage of your capacity you're at and all those variables, um, it's fine. You don't have to wait till the end of 24 weeks to apply for forgiveness. So you, it's really, it's up to 24 weeks from your date of funding. So a lot of people don't really understand that that is now the case. So that is really where the quote, in my mind, flexibility comes in. It's not just necessarily that you have to track all these costs for 24 weeks and keep everybody employed for 24 weeks. You know, you can literally um, spend the money for how you need it. And if that happens in less than 24 weeks, then, then you're good. So, so there's that. Um, the other thing is they increase the minimum term for any loans that remain after you've gone through the process of requesting forgiveness to five years. If you recall in the original PPP program, it was two years. And for a restaurant company with a six month deferral into that two year period, that's a year and a half to pay that loan back. Um, and so that was a problem. And for a lot of restaurants, when they didn't know how much forgiveness they were actually gonna get, that was an issue for them. So now you have five years, so it is a longer term. Um, it extends the deferral period until forgiveness is remitted to the lender. So that just means that, you know, you've got this longer time frame. You have up to 10 months from the end of your covered period to actually apply for forgiveness. So it also extended that period. So I mentioned the 10 months. So let's go to the next slide. So just as kind of a quick refresher, so if you haven't applied for a PPP loan, what are the pieces that you can include in, the, in that uh, forgiveness money? So the first one is payroll costs. And as we all know, that now has been switched. It was 75% of your loan value, now it's 60%. So that also makes it helpful for restaurants who might not be at full staff yet, even till the end of this year, they may not be at full staff. So you're able to achieve that 60% a little bit easier uh, than the 75. So it's gonna include salaries, wages, group health care, retirement benefits, and the employer portion of any state or local payroll taxes. So this doesn't include FICA. FICA is a federal program. Um, it's only employer paid. So if the employee contributes to a 401k or something like that, that doesn't get included. It's only employer paid. So let's go on to the next slide. We're just gonna cover some of these quickly because a lot of people know this. There's additional information in here. The one thing I wanted to mention on this slide is this concept of the alternative payroll covered period. So the concept behind that is it, depending on the timing of when you do your payroll, if you pay weekly or bi-weekly or semi-monthly or all the different ways people do payroll, if depending on the date you get your money for your loan, then you would sort of say, well, my next payroll period is going to begin say two weeks from today. So this was really a big issue with an eight week period, as you might imagine. Now that that's been extended to 24 weeks, it's not as big of a deal, but you can start your cycle for payroll on your normal cycle, not have to adjust anything, and then you'll be able to start counting from there, say it's two weeks later. It also is the same on the back end because you also will be able to designate the end of that alternative payroll covered period to tie into your existing payroll cycle, which would tie into your filing of your quarter eight nine. 41 returns. Uh, so all of that, you don't have to do any extra special reporting or changing anything. So that's very helpful. And that was that interpretive guidance came out a little bit later into um, the beginning of the PPP program. And then it just talks about, uh, you know, the different schedules you would submit. This is all for forgiveness and that type of thing. Um, and it's also, um, yeah, so those are, I won't go into all the details, but anyway, so we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, so then um, non-payroll costs. So non-payroll costs consist of uh, mortgage on a, interest on a mortgage. So not the principal, but the interest. And if you're, if you're uh, renting your, your space, leasing, then it, it's the rent. Um, and that can be percentage rent. That can be straight line, you know, whatever, whatever you're paying to the landlord. Utilities would be things like obviously electric, gas, excuse me. <coughs> and then we mentioned in here, <coughs> Um, interest on other debt obligations. So these could be um, sort of up for interpretation. So we have a note here, may not be considered for forgiveness. So obviously they're considered non-payroll, but um, 
depending on your situation, you might have some other debt situations, but again, it would only be interest, it would never be principal. Um, the other important thing to remind is you have to have a contract in place. So if you had signed a uh, contract with a utility company or something, and you opened your restaurant, you know, in March, um, you would not be able to claim those costs because it would have to be before 215. And that's just a set date for every single company. Okay, let's go on. So um, one of the things that is important to mention is it doesn't allow you to prepay. So if you think, oh, I'm gonna get cute, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to prepay my rent for the next month. Uh, well, it doesn't really let you do that. At least we're not sure that it would let you do that. So to be on the safe side, uh, probably not good to push that too much. However, if you have a utility bill and that utility bill crosses your covered period and goes into, you can always do a pro rata calculation of the days that happen within your covered period um, and claim those, that would never be a problem. Um, anyway, and then max forgiveness was the 40% for non-payroll because it's the 60% for payroll. So let's go on to the next slide. So how does the covered period work? This is a nice diagram. So it just kind of shows you, you look at when your loan got funded, not when you applied. It has nothing to do with the covered period. It's when the loan gets funded. So in this example, April 15th is when this company got the money. And then they can either go with, quote, the covered period, which begins immediately on the day of funding and goes for eight weeks or now 24. Um, or you can choose this alternative payroll covered period, which would begin the first day of your next pay period. And that could go, it could lapse towards the end. You know, it takes you then to a little bit longer eight week period when you start at a little later date. It just pushes the same eight weeks out um, for another few days when you start a little bit later. So let's go on to the next one. So we talked a little bit about um, this, and um, that's, we've kind of talked about that. We can skip through this. There's a lot of detail in these slides. I'm not going to cover every single little point here. So I want to give some time to my buddy, Rachel, to talk a little about tax. There's so many good tax things. So one of the things that I wanted to mention in the Flexibility Act is they now have indicated there's actually three safe harbors um, related to the FTE reduction test. So for those of you that might have already begun the process of um, trying to apply for forgiveness or started to calculate some things, um, there's basically, you have to take a look at your full-time equivalents and calculate those and compare those to a, a period of time prior to COVID. So one of the things that happens is there's people that weren't able to rehire previous employees uh, and if they can't find somebody suitable this could apply maybe not so much for restaurants maybe more for other very high you know very specific industries that have certain skill sets unable to return to the same level of business activity well this certainly applies to restaurants um, and then there's another one I'll show you on another slide so that was another thing that happened with the flexibility act that they said hey if you can't return to the same level of business activity as, as the government started to see that restaurants weren't able to reopen even at the reduced capacity levels to hit those even in some cases they said wow you know this is going to go on longer than i think we originally thought so we want to make sure that if a company can't really return to their same level of business activity because of governmental cdc osha whatever um we have to give them a pass on that fte count because they just can't get there and this was obviously really an issue with an eight-week period, covered period, and a 75% uh, amount of payroll costs as a percentage of your loan, but still it does matter. The other thing that's really good is there is a deferral of FICA that's been allowed, um, if, but if you got a PPP loan, you couldn't do that. And that allows you to defer FICA for the whole rest of 2020 for the next two years. So you would pay half of it back in 2021 and the other half in 2022. Well, now they're saying, yeah, if you get a PPP loan, we're going to allow you to take that deferral option, which again, is just kind of a cash uh, flow measure uh, to help uh, restaurants out. Uh, one of the other things I get asked a lot, and we can ask Rachel her opinion on this, and that is that some of these forgiveness items like payroll and other non-payroll expenses, um, you would can you deduct those when you come around to doing your taxes for 2020? And they really haven't addressed it. Um, personally, I feel that probably is like double dipping. So I feel like that's not probably the intent of the PPP uh, program or law. Um, and I would say probably they won't allow that. But people are still trying to ask about that. Rachel, how would you weigh in on the deductibility of these expenses? 
was going to say at this point, you know, we're we're trying to encourage everybody to look at it as the fact that they will not be deductible. You know, kind of preparing for worst case scenario at this point. The conundrum that we're coming up though is with the 24 weeks, particularly if you're a business with a fiscal year, there may be some businesses that your year end closes out prior to any forgiveness of those expenses. So it's a little bit confusing because will those expenses be deductible in one year and then recaptured in another year? You know, as Karen said, there really hasn't been too much in the way of, you know, guidance on what we're supposed to do with this at this point, but I have a feeling that it's something that will be coming out in the near future particularly because as they've told us, the PPP funds themselves are, will not be a taxable item, which is great. But whenever you look at the fact that you're using these to pay true business expenses, it in turn is kind of creating a tax situation that we may not be expecting because rather than taking those expenses like we always would have, we now probably have funds from folks coming in the door and eating at our establishments without a payroll expense to then match to that. So it may create a tax situation that we just need to keep our eye on in case this is something that isn't, you know, finalized by year end with guidance, but hopefully we'll have some answers sooner rather than later. Excellent. So let's go on to the next slide here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these safe harbors. So a little more specifics here. So related to the situation of not being able to return to the same level of business activity, which I think is the safe harbor that most applies to restaurants, uh, you're going to compare your business activity to what you were doing, levels of, of revenues and, and levels of headcount that you had prior to February 15th. Um, and then basically it stems directly from any, uh, or indirectly. So this is a new interpretation that came with the Flexibility Act is that originally it was just saying, well, it was if it directly. So in other words, COVID, the governor of your state told you to shut down. Well, now it could be indirectly. So it could be a business that services, like say the food service industry, you know, that, that, um, that serves, that provides food to restaurants. They're not gonna have as much business because the restaurants are only open at 25% capacity. So their staff at US Food Service or Cisco or whatever, you know, isn't going to be as, as probably at normal levels. So they would be able to also apply for a PPP loan and basically be able to claim that, yeah, you know, my business couldn't come back to normal until all of my restaurant clients were operating at their normal levels. So this concept of indirectly is actually really significant um, in adding that to the the law um, to be able to really state that in the law and not that be maybe something that people were assuming would be the case, but now it's stated exactly that it's directly or indirectly. So I wanted to make a point of that. Um, the other safe harbor really had to do with reducing your FTEs. Um, and if you restore them by either when you get your, when you apply for the loan or December 31st, uh, because this program, you know, and, I, and one thing I didn't say is, I think it might be coming in a slide, it actually has been extended to August 8th. So we actually have another month of PPP uh, applications that are possible. So that would be, you know, sometime in July or August if you haven't yet applied. Um, and obviously it'll always be before 30, December 31st because the program will end. Anyway, so if you don't reduce your, um, if you, if reduce them between February and April and you restore them by the time you applied for the loan, um, then you would be able to claim that safe harbor. I don't think that's as necessarily as pertinent in the restaurant industry. There's other industries I think it applies more to. Let's go on to the next slide. This one is kind of detailed. It talks about some of the pieces of payroll costs. But the other thing I wanted to mention is this concept of paid and incurred. So, you know, one of the things that has been a little bit gray or nebulous in the CARES Act, the original act that established the PPP program, or some of the other, um, you know, the Forgiveness Act, or I'm sorry, the Flexibility Act, um, talked about uh, you must have incurred it and paid it. Well, you know, a lot of times you're paying for things in arrears. Or in advance. So this, um, there's still a lot of gray around this. Um, some of the other things we've looked into is uh, bonuses and hazard pay. Could people pay bonuses during that eight week period? A lot of these uh, strategies really came out of having only eight weeks and really having to get that 75% of your, of your loan amount uh, spent 
uh, within that eight week period. So a lot of this stuff has, we're gonna relax a bit now that we do, we can go with a longer period if we need to. Um, and also the concept of non-payroll costs is they, they provide an example. If you take a look at the FAQ that's on the SPA website that talks about, you can really get a little bit more than two months of allowable costs, depending on the timing of your utility bills, for example, would probably be, or when you pay your rents um, in the month, um, say you pay on the 15th or something like that. Uh, but two things that we really don't have a lot of guidance still on are prepayments that would likely not be allowed um, or amounts and arrears like people have asked me, well, you know, we accrued a bonus at the end of 19, we had a good year. We, we usually don't pay that out till April of 2020. Uh, can we include that as a payment we're making during our measurement period? Well, no, because it really related to 2019. So that, those are things that uh, to be, I think, on the safe side, you wouldn't want to be too aggressive with your position on that. Um, so there's that. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So one of the other things that came out in the last couple of weeks with the 24 week period in the Flexibility Act is they're now limiting employees to 46,154. That would be the maximum amount of, comp of cash compensation that they would could receive and be claimed. And then owners are, are only getting 20,833. So if you're an owner operator in your restaurant, basically it's two and a half months of your 2019 payroll, obviously subject to a $100,000 max. Uh, but in the eight week period, you were using the number 15385 for your employees. And that was based on your comp cash compensation during the covered period or the adjusted covered period, alternative covered period. And owners, it was based on your 2019, either you have a W-2 or a Schedule C or a K-1. So it was based on that for eight weeks. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is measuring FTE. So if you get in a situation where you can't claim the other things and you have to do the FTE calc when you're requesting uh, forgiveness, then it was uh, guidance came out recently that, that gave specific information about how to calculate FTEs. There was really nothing on the SBA website that addressed this. And so they came out and said, no, 40 hours or more a week is considered one. And then under the simplified method and fewer than that is 0.5. So either every person is either a 0.5 or a one. If you use a simplified method, but if you use a standard method, you're taking all the actual hours work and divide by 40 to get that fractional number, but capped at one. So if someone can't be more than a one. So it's very interesting. I've been coaching clients on whether they're using the standard or simplified method in their forgiveness calc, because it can be different depending on your, your business and the, how many people you have working and things like that. So you want to do both calculations. Um, to understand which one is going to give you, and you're always going to want to go for the higher head counts during COVID or during your measurement period, because that's going to be compared to pre-COVID. So you want to get that FTE count to be as high as you possibly can. So one of these may help you one better than the other. So you want to do both calculations. And then they did provide for some exceptions. So things related to uh, if you offered to rehire, you should be keeping track of those emails that you send to offer to hire or your paperwork or related. And if you, if the person says no, you can still claim them as an FTE because you tried to hire them. Um, if you offered to restore their hours and the person said, no, I don't, I don't want to only want to work 10 hours a week. So I'm getting unemployment and I can get both. Uh, only till the end of July, mind you, the, the federal $600 will end coming up here soon. Um, and other things you can see here, if they had voluntarily resigned during the covered period. So if there were anything like that that happened during the covered period that really wasn't your fault as an owner, um, you don't have to reduce that person from your FTE count. So that is a pretty recent interpretation. Next slide, please. <coughs> So we talked a little bit about this already. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. So there's two ways to apply for forgiveness. There's the easy form. Where do you think that came from? Maybe the IRS. <laughs> so there's the easy and there's the non-easy, I guess. So the easy form allows for people that have pretty simplified businesses to just fill out a very simple form. So if they're self-employed with no employees, well, gosh, 
That, that makes it easy, right? Um, if they meet the safe harbors for no wage or headcount reductions, you don't have a need to fill out three other tabs that are on that form, uh, on the 3508 long form, I'll call it. Um, and if you meet the safe harbor for no wage reduction and that you were unable to operate. So I'm really feeling that a lot of restaurants are gonna be able to make use of the easy form. It takes a lot less effort to put together, a lot less record keeping um, and support that has to be provided. So I, I counsel all my clients, try the EZ form, see if it's gonna work for you before you even try the other form. And hopefully it will work for you and then you don't have to do that because it's a lot more work. Um, so anyway, there's also a new form for, for any reason you haven't applied for forgiveness, which most people haven't because the banks aren't ready yet. Um, just wanna make sure you're using the most current 3508 because there was a prior one out there. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so when to apply for PPP forgiveness? So I would assume that like any accountant, okay, everything's done. I want to apply for forgiveness right away, right? Uh, well, not necessarily, because basically there's a lot of things that are still being interpreted. Um, there's things that we don't know for sure, so you might want to wait. That's one reason. Another reason is that lenders aren't ready. <laughs> so most people I've talked to, they said they've talked to their bank and their bank says, hey, it's going to be another two or three weeks before I can accept an application for forgiveness. So obviously you don't want to wait a long time, but you have the time now. You don't have such pressure on that. Then, from the time you submit your package to the lender, they have 60 days to process that, to get it to the SBA, and then the SBA has 90 days to review it. So nothing is going to happen very quick with the government, and I'm sure that's a shocker to everyone on the call, okay? So anyway, um, and then if you don't request forgiveness within 10 months of the end of your covered period, not 10 months, my gosh, that could be the end of your covered period might be 24 weeks. That could be December 31st. And then you have 10 more months after that. If you don't request forgiveness, then they're going to start servicing the loan and you'll have to start paying it back. But um, you get it a long time to request forgiveness. So you don't need to rush, don't need to worry, collect all your information um, and make your package as perfect as possible. And that will assure that things get through. Um, the only other reason to not wait a long time is because you will be paying interest. So the longer, if you, if you are not walking away from a loan and gotten full forgiveness, then you will have that to deal with. I see a question that's just popped up. Um, what was the question? So Karen, Dave asks, if he applies for PPP forgiveness today, does the 50% indoor capacity impact the FTE reduction test? For example, a number of employees are currently working at about 50, or I'm sorry, 60 to 70% of what they were working in February pre-COVID. So I would say uh, the issue with that is you can wait longer to apply and extend out your covered period. You have up to 24 weeks. So if you haven't spent all of your money, your 60% on payroll costs, you want to keep going if you're not at that capacity uh, yet because you want to make sure you can get 100% forgiveness. Hopefully I answered your question. Let us know. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think I'm about done. Um, I think there might be one more slide. Let's see what's on the next slide here. Oh, yeah. So there are some resources. I encourage everybody. The Treasury website's not as, as user-friendly. It can be complicated. The SBA website is actually terrific. They have a wonderful FAQ. It goes on for 30 or 40 pages. Lots of information in there. Lots of examples. Uh, so that's very helpful. CLA has a COVID relief center. I encourage you to check it out. We have so much out there in terms of resources. I've written several articles. Rachel and I wrote an article together. Um, you know, there are um, all sorts of other information around um, just for different industries um, and different things. Also, you can obviously engage with CLA. We are offering special packages for doing your forgiveness calculation. We can do it for you. We can review yours. Um, which is less expensive. Um, and we can also do custom if you might have a lot of entities, a lot of LLCs, and you had to apply separately for your PPP loans for each entity. Um, you know, that can be more complex and we would kind of charge you a rate per hour to do that. But we are available to do that kind of work as well. You can reach out to either Rachel or myself on that front. So anyway, so on to you, Rachel, to tell us about some of the tax stuff going on. Thank you. 
So as Karen said, I am a manager in our tax group here and Karen and I work together very often, but I concentrate more on the tax side. Um, so I wanted to go over a couple of things today. The PPP funds are certainly a great infusion of cash into the business, but there's a lot of things out there that, you know, relate to the tax that is more, you know, money that's available to you out there that I don't want anybody to miss out on. So slide please. All right, so the first one, particularly as we are hiring new employees, I'm sure many of you have seen too, there are employees that are not coming back to work for various reasons. So we're going out and finding some new folks in the market to join our teams. This credit is available only to brand new employees. So unfortunately not for any of those rehires that we're bringing back, but with new employees, it's a credit of, credit of anywhere between $2,400 to $9,600 per person. And you can see there, the criteria is a minimum of 120 hours within 12 months of employment. So not very high. I mean, this can qualify for temporary employees, part-time employees, but also those full-time folks too. Um, a lot of times we see this as it relates to long-term employment. Uh, so anyone that's been on unemployment for longer than 24 weeks, folks in other groups such as veterans, ex-felons, uh, folks that were food food stamp recipients. So there's actually quite a bit of criteria out there. So this is something certainly worth looking for. I mean, again, this is a tax credit. So it's a dollar for dollar against taxes. So really, you know, a pretty good benefit out there if it's available to you. Next slide. All right, the next one is the employee retention tax credit. So this actually cannot be combined with the payroll protection program, but if, it, if you haven't applied for a PPP loan, this is something that's available to you um, if you have kept employees during the downturn. So this is limited to 50% of compensation up to $10,000 per employee for the time period of March the 13th through the end of this year. But what it does is it kind of gives the business, you know, credit for keeping those folks even during the COVID period, whenever business would have declined more than 50% compared to that same quarter in the prior year. Next slide. So then the next one, which we're seeing a lot with our restaurant owners and retail shops, I'm not sure if everyone remembers, but a few years ago during the Tax Act, they changed the qualified improvement property from 15 years to 39 years. This was a mistake that happened in the writing of the article. Everyone thought that it would be fixed right away, but unfortunately it wasn't. So what we noticed was at the end of 2000. 17 and all through 2018, anytime you were doing improvements to your property, these things were being depreciated over a 39 year period and not eligible for bonus depreciation. So anyone doing build out or something like that, you know, the, the, this was a huge loss because we were taking almost 40 years to recoup, you know, the costs that were incurred to build those, those projects out. What they did with the CARES Act was they went back and amended this code to say that though all of those improvement properties, and again, those are improvements done to an interior portion of the building, uh, not including escalators or elevators, but any kind of interior build out, are now qualified for a 15 year recovery period, which also makes them eligible for bonus depreciation. So technically your build out could be written off immediately, which would be a huge deduction for most people. Now again, because this goes back and corrects this from the end of 2017, this is something that can be captured on your 2019 tax return or even on your 2020 tax return as a change in accounting method, or if you'd like, you could go back and amend that 2018 return. So it's important to talk to your tax preparer about what is the better situation for you and what kind of funds you're looking at recuperating with those deductions. Next slide. All right, this is the business interest limitation. 
I'm not sure how many folks ran into this, but this was something new for 2018. The IRS had come in and established a, a limitation whenever it came to the write-off of business interest. They looked at what the adjusted taxable income was for that year and limited it to 30% when looking at the overall interest that the business had paid during the year and carried whatever interest was non-deductible forward to the next year. You know, particularly businesses that were highly leveraged, this was a huge, you know, decrease in deductions for them whenever it was interest that was actually paid by the company. So now for 2019 and 20, they've changed this to 50%, which allows a lot of folks a higher deduction, if not the entire deduction. So certainly something to look at if you've previously had an interest limitation in the past. Next slide. All right, the excessive business loss limitation. And this is one of those things that actually could be twofold. So the CARES Act has suspended any kind of limitation that deals with an excess business loss. So whenever we're looking at the qualified improvement property and bonus depreciation, this is something that could cause the business to, for tax purposes, to appear to have a very large loss. In the past, this was something that was calculated on a personal return and limited those losses for that particular year, forcing them to be carried forward. Now with this limitation gone, a taxpayer can have a much larger loss and be able to utilize that entire loss in the tax period, rather than being forced to limit it and carry it into a different year. Next slide. Which brings me to the net operating loss. So in the event that you have a year where these losses are actually putting your return into an overall loss standpoint where you know we're offsetting any kind of income and still projecting a loss for the business we're able to carry those losses back for five years which you know with everything going on right now it's not unusual that businesses will see more losses but whenever we look back five years ago you know the world was a lot different so we were making money any taxes that were paid during those periods this is an option to go back and recover those, ta those taxes now, rather than waiting to carry these losses to a future period. So this is a way to go out back and get some of those tax dollars and infuse that cash directly into the business now, rather than waiting for the future for that benefit. All right, and then last but not least, I know Karen had mentioned this as well, but there is a payroll tax deferral that's available too. Again, this is only on the employer portion of Social Security tax, but it's 6.2% that you're able to defer until the end of this year. So what you're doing is on your payroll return, uh, the 941 every quarter, it's taking this portion and not requiring it to be part of your payment for that particular quarter. These taxes are due, but 50% will be due at the end of December of 2021, and the other 50% at 2022. So again, this is just giving you more cash flow as you kind of get through, we don't want to call it the new normal, um, our current normal, I should say, um, but giving you the cash to be able to spend on the things that you need while we, you know, find our way through this crazy world right now. All right, so as you can see in the last slide here, this is my information and Karen's information in case you have any questions or anything that we can help with. As Karen said, we've written many articles and you know, her and I are kind of immersed in this right now. So please feel free to visit our website, look at all of those resources, but feel free to reach out to either of us personally as well. Uh, thanks so much, Rachel and Karen. Um, we did get one more question in the chat um, referring to the PPP loans. And this question is, does each individual person need to meet 75% of their pre-COVID total pay? Or is the rule that we cannot reduce their salary rate or pay rate by more than 25%? So for the sake of simplification, is it total pay for the entire period, for the entire covered period, or is it the like wage or rate?
Karen, so, you want to take that one? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to keep the noise down. So uh, under the new uh, Flexibility Act, the fact that you only have to hit the 60% of your loan value with your payroll costs, so that's the first piece. So the 75% no longer applies. And that is for anybody who's ever gotten a PPP loan. So if you got a PPP loan back in April and you were just nearing the end of your eight week period in June, you actually only have to hit the 60%, even though that wasn't part of your deal when you got your loan. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Um, I'm trying to remember the other part of the question. Um, so hey, I'm seeing Kevin saying, I'm talking about the individual person pay requirement, not the total amount. So the individual uh, person pay amount, if you're talking about you're maxed out at the, um, under the 24 week rule, you're maxed out at the 20,000 and under the uh, eight week, uh, it was 15,000. So that's really to take an annualization of 100,000 and divide it by those number of weeks. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Kevin, feel free to unmute if, uh we need to hash this one out a little bit more. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, go yep. ahead. Sorry, so I'm talking about the requirement that you can't reduce an individual's pay by more than 25% based on their pre-COVID um, or whatever we use for a measurement period. Is that their total pay in terms of dollars or is that their pay rate only? That's the pay in terms of dollars. Okay, so let's say we had someone that worked last year, you know, we had an eight week PPP loan and we had someone work last year, the full eight weeks and made $15,000 um, or $16,000, let's say for simplicity, we would have to pay them at least $12,000 this year to not have them kind of as a, a reduction, count as a reduction. That's correct. Business. Yes, that's correct. And as members, I talked about the FTE safe harbor, right, that you'd be able to actually, um, you know, the fact that you had kept them on, that you're not going to be impacted there. But unfortunately, you have to pass both tests, the FTE test and the payroll cost dollar amount. So some clients have paid a bonus to kind of get them to hit that level. But yes, for as soon as you take them below uh, 25% or above a 25% reduction, right, to make it mm -hmm. higher than that, you do have to make up that difference to be able to get the full forgiveness. Okay. And then what if, so if that person's hired the last week of the covered period, we would still have to pay them $12,000 in that scenario, even though they only worked one week of the eight weeks? Well, you know, I guess that would be a situation I would say that unless it's just that one individual in particular, um, you know, if you're willing to not get full forgiveness, you wouldn't necessarily have to pay them. Number one, you don't always have to get full forgiveness. And you can also extend your period. You don't have to go in eight weeks. So, you know, the only downside on that is if you have a loan left, you're only going to have uh, two years to pay it back unless you go back to your lender and renegotiate to try to get a five-year term. Okay. If that helps. Yeah. And then I guess I had a clarification on Dave's question from earlier, because I actually had the same question. Um, he was saying, um, since we're right now forced to be closed uh, or forced to be at 50% capacity, which would allow us to have the safe harbor. Um, if we end up, ex you know, saying, let's say we want to take it to 24 weeks, you know, with the new uh, forgiveness, if we end up being able to be open at 100% during the 24 weeks, maybe like halfway through, let's say, yep. are we still going to be in the safe harbor, um, even though that you know, we were only forced to be at 50% for half of the 24 weeks? Well, see, that's kind of a gray area. You know, um, I, I understand why you're asking the question. It's been kind of on my mind as well. You know, it's, it, it becomes an issue if you extend your covered period out for the full 24 weeks, you may be subject to fluctuations that require you to reduce your FTEs. Um, and if it's not sort of mandated just because your business is down, 
um, and you're just making a good business decision, um, then that's why some people are saying, hey, I don't really want to wait a full 24 weeks because once you get everything submitted for forgiveness and you make whatever changes you need to make to your business, you know, we believe that that's not going to have a problem, you know, create a problem for you. But it, as long as you've applied for forgiveness and you've kind of stopped the clock, if you will, right? But if you sure. keep the clock running and keep paying people and hope that business improves or whatever, you might get into a situation where you end up having to further reduce your FTEs and have some partial lack of forgiveness because you've kept that open measurement period and there's no official mandate requiring you to, to stay or, you know, to, to close, uh, but your business hasn't returned to the levels. That to me is a little bit of a great interpretation of the business hasn't returned to the levels, right? As opposed to the governor made me go back to 100%, but my business hasn't recovered. I, I would still think of generally, that's my personal opinion, you know, that you probably could make an argument if you're still down 20 or 30 percent from your prior year levels during that time and you're allowed to be at 100 percent capacity which could happen mm -hmm. um you know i would think you would probably be able to make an argument that hey you know i just kept using my money paying my people as much as it made sense from a business perspective for how to staff my restaurant given the um, amount of business that we had hopefully that's helpful yeah that's great thank you all right. Well, thanks, everybody. It was great to be a part of this. Uh, love Minnesota Hospitality Association. And hopefully we'll get a chance to have other discussions that are more fun and not as uh, crazy as the period we're living in. Thank you. Yep. Thanks so much, Rachel and Karen. And for folks on the call, we'll get the slides out to you um, in the next 24 hours or so. And then a recording will be available within the next week. Um, and we hope to see you uh, for any one of our future Operating Now webinars. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.